wisdom, prudentia, justice, justicia, temperance, temperantia, courage, fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Uh, I'm Steve, coming to you from somewhat beautiful Conway, Arkansas, and I am joined today, I'm so lucky to be joined again today by Karen Duffy. If you have not listened to our first episode together, or if you live under a rock, Karen Duffy is a former MTV VJ, model, New York Times bestselling author. Oh, we'll talk about, she has a, a vast resume, a lot of life experiences, which actually come to play in the book we're going to talk about today. She has a new book coming out, which is one of Oprah Daly's 50 most anticipated books of 2022, Wise Up. Irreverent Enlightenment from a Mother Who's Been Through It. Duff, welcome back to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. Thank you, Steve. I listen to you, and it's always great to see you. Um, so thank you for um, your contributions uh, to helping me become a little less stupid. I greatly appreciate it. I, I work on that myself, darn near <laughs> every day. <laughs> so uh, how, how have you been? How did your family... Last time we talked, we weren't on the brink of World War III, and there was no pandemic. Uh, how has your family been faring this last couple of years? Well, thank you very much for asking. Um, I would say about 50% of our family uh, did get COVID, um, and uh, I am dialing in from New York City, and uh, I will tell you, I was thinking about two years ago and the sound of seven o'clock. Every evening at seven o'clock, people would lean out their windows and bang on pots and pans uh, all over the city because it was when the uh, healthcare professionals were swift switching off on their 12 hour shifts. And I was just thinking about the sound of seven o'clock mm. and how that has changed my beautiful city, my beautiful, filthy, stinking city. And um, it's, it's been devastating here. It's, 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 been, it's been devastating everywhere, but it's really to see the increase of suffering has it's been very difficult An increase in homelessness and job insecurity just seeing generations of family businesses just out in one minute so Absolutely. um uh but uh i think it is as we know we can't control what happens we can only control our response and um we tried to make the best of it. And uh, my son was able to stay in school and, and it was interesting. So we were all working, my, my son was home from school and my husband was at home working. And so the three of us were in the apartment and it felt like all three of us worked for the same company, but in different branches. So my husband was in finance, my kid was in academics. And I was like, what about me? And they're like, yeah, you're entertainment. But um, we, 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 we survived and I, I am racing back to embrace the world. And, um, uh, and I just think this is an opportunity for all of us to recognize how resilient we are and how important and how the Stoics speak about how resilience is a huge part of character and strength. And uh, we've made it and we're gonna keep getting stronger. Absolutely, yeah, it was a similar story here, just so many businesses falling, disappearing and, and people unfortunately also <laughs> uh, yes. getting sick and, and dying. And, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, some folks who uh, unfortunately want to pretend nothing's happening. And, and so it's, it's an interesting dynamic, I'm afraid, but, uh, but it's been an interesting couple of years to say the least. It is. And um, I find that the more I learn about 
Stoic philosophy, uh, the more it can apply to just so many areas of our lives mm -hmm. and how Stoicism really dilates the soul. It just really, I think, uh, prepares us to bring out, I think, our strengths. I mean, I, I love the idea of, you know, focusing on what is in our control, but also, as Marcus Aurelius said, like, with, um, you know, don't mourn for what you, you know, celebrate what you have, don't mourn for what you mm -hmm. do not have, which was uh, something that kept us going, but it's hard to believe it's been two years. Absolutely. But one thing you do have uh, is a new book coming out, probably the day I'll release this episode. So that oh. way they will coincide. Um, so Great. So when I see that huge spike, I know I can thank you. So <gasps> absolutely. Thank absolutely. You. You'll know what it was. Yeah, that was me. It was on me. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> let's start with let's start with the fact that this this book you have out is a series of letters. And I think one of the first chapters or, or, or uh, uh, an introduction in, in the book is about why you write letters. And you, I have learned, are a letter writer. Would you like to start us yes. off with the power of letters and why, why you write so many letters? Well, um, uh, I live with a chronic uh, illness and a pain condition, and I'm going to have to actually put some medicine on because uh, I tend... Uh, it's raining here and it really is kicking up a fuss today. Um, I write letters because every day we have a choice to be useful or useless. And on days when I am not particularly high functioning, I can write a thank you letter. And it's not email, it's not about reciprocity, it's just about sending a note out into the world, thanking someone. And honestly, it makes me feel better. And hopefully the intended recipient will feel acknowledged. And that's it. It's a very simple um, habit uh, that I started when I was a kid um, wow. and uh, really picked it up again uh, in early adulthood. Um, but uh it was interesting. I've been working on Wise Up and pretty much actually every uh, book that I've written uh, for the past 20 years has been illuminated by the Stoics. I mean, my very first book, Model Patient, I, there's a lot of Marcus Aurelius, uh, uh, many quotes from Marcus Aurelius in that book. And uh, so I was working on a book of essays and I was at a, um, a film institute, a film lab in Greece, and was working on this book and thinking and watching movies. It's a creative workshop. And I just thought these essays will be so much more powerful if it's in epistolary form, because it is my goal to find the humor and the happiness uh, in, in the Stoics. And there is so much. I find, I just think anybody who has such a radiant mind as uh, our four favorite Stoics, you, I don't know one person who uh, is smart and lacks a sense of humor. So I imagine that they all had a great sense. So it was interesting. Um, I wanted, I asked my son because I wanted the reader to feel loved and I'm thinking, well, I love my son very much. And I asked him if I could have his permission to address the letters in wise up to him. Oh. And he agreed. And, uh, which was really, uh, I'm delighted. And then he actually wrote a letter back to me. Yeah. So in, in writing a letter, um, to a, a young a young man, I'm able to squeeze in you know as many naughty bits as I can, as which I would do when I was conversing with a friend. Yeah, so so I I really enjoyed your writing style and and your you have a lot of humor in your writing as well as lots of anecdotes, interesting tidbits that I I 
wouldn't expect little little breaks in the book with factoids like i am now studying tyromancy now i think that's my calling in life which is which is uh, uh, uh basically fortune telling with cheese or something along these lines I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a fan of the cheese so i think i could combine this love of cheese with with a new a new hobby uh well you know cheese is milk's leap towards immortality <laughs> and you usually there is not moderation in cheese mm-hmm. you either love it you're never like eh. people who my husband is like he could just eat cheese every night and um <laughs> it's uh every night for dinner which um which i think it's great but i loved i i as a writer i work like a magpie i mm. just we were talking about memory early earlier and how we often forget 80% of what we've learned the day before. So I, I mean, if you could see my table, I'm just, I've balled up bits of paper and I write down notes to myself and I learned in journalism just to always have a reporter's notebook and by taking notes and not with my thumbs digitally, but using my uh, penmanship. Yeah. It is ways that you can remember. Um, and it's like a magpie collecting all these crackpot uh, bits of information, stories that made me laugh, stories that maybe just go, no way. And, uh, and then the joy is weaving it all together. I definitely get the impression that you must read a lot based on your writing style and all of these as, as I as reading. And I think you mentioned reading in the book as well, but reading must be one of your passions i would i would assume you know steve i believe it is possible to read yourself a new brain and i grew up in a family of jocks and uh there were more sports balls than books and i just would go to the library the used bookstore and absolutely immersed myself and read myself a new brain and um, I'm not, uh, I, I, my physical activities have somewhat slowed down a wee bit. Uh, and the upside is that it's more time for me to sit in uh, a room with a cup of tea and read. And mm-hmm. there, to me, that is what heaven is. Heaven <laughs> is a, a giant library. I love that um, in the first, in one of the earliest uh, libraries on earth, uh, it says, this is a house of healing for the soul. Hmm. And I love, I love that idea. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of Seneca's early letters is about retiring and, and reading and, and, and taking time to, to grow internally if you can. And, and, uh, and it's, it's a very powerful tool. Absolutely. Um, Mm -hmm. so how do you, do you, uh, do you, I, I think in your book, you say you make lists when you hear people talking about books, you just have a list of books to read and then you attack you know, them. I, I, I think I, I said like no one was ever like wise by chance. Like, <laughs> like the same way that you don't um, gain muscle by chance. You can lose weight by chance, but you really need attention to gain muscle. It has to be intended. And um, I like the idea of having a reading plan. Uh, I live about 10 blocks away from Theodore Roosevelt's birthplace. Mm. And Theodore Roosevelt was a speed reader. And he read three books a day. He read a book before breakfast. This was while he was president. And while he was uh, commissioner of the New York Police Department. He, I love the fact that he had a habit. Busiest man, the most powerful man in the world, still could read three books a day. I mean, the statistics are, I think, a high school, average high school educated person reads about four books a year and, and a college education between five and 10. And uh, a couple of days for Theodore. Think, this yeah. is a great time for books. Um, <laughs> And yeah. uh, I just, I'm never without a book. And 
my kid is like, you know, you when he's playing video games, he's like, you've got your nose in a book all the time. I just have my fingers engaged. So we just have different appendages. Come so how, how old is your son now? Is he uh, he's a senior? Yet? Oh, senior. He's, okay. he's a senior in high school. Um, and uh, he'll be graduating this summer, this spring. And uh, he gave his senior talk about Ooh. stoicism, oh, wow. which ignited Greek fire in my heart. So how yeah. did you, how did you get your son? I, I have a five-year-old, so I can't imagine how to pull this off yet. Uh, <laughs> and I know part of it's out of my control, of course, but how did you steer your son or at least give him the, 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 the stoic fire, as it were, the interest in stoicism? How did you trickle that into his, his, into his life? Was it talks? Was it read this? Was it through example? What was your, what's your technique there? Well, I think, yeah, uh, by example, um, and we have a no tech at the table rule. And uh, so we only have you know, the sports pages and philosophy books. And s since he was able to read and uh, honestly, Ryan Holiday's The Daily Stoic was mm -hmm. a great gateway for a kid. Um, and it started making sense. Uh, he's also a hockey player and uh, he's a goalie. And uh, one of, I really had to rely on my stoic beliefs that uh, I would not, I couldn't, this was his love, his passion. He's very skilled and if I worried about his safety, I would decant some of his happiness. I would, and I, I didn't want to do that. And so uh, I wasn't always successful. And I just remember Jack saying, come on, mom, as Aristotle said, worry is misuse of the imagination. <laughs> and then it was so worth uh, 12 years of early mornings in the freezing hockey rinks in the Northeast to hear him parrot back to me. Absolutely. And this this kind of goes, goes together with one of your first chapters, which is the importance of choosing a, or of having a life philosophy. Uh, and, uh, and you, you write to your son about that. Would you like to comment a little bit on what's, why should we bother choosing stoicism or any other form of philosophy as a guidepost? Any, I feel like we always need a plan. Uh, if you don't have a goal, how will you reach it? And uh, I have always felt a real communion with the stoics. Um, and, and just explaining, it's the, the gift of talking about this book is uh, people have this idea uh, that philosophy is purely for academics or people in black turtlenecks and berets smoking galois to the filter. Uh, and it's, what I love about stoicism is that it's so radiantly practical. It's so alive. And I love that it was written 20 centuries ago, but it reads as if the ink is still wet. <laughs> One of my favorite bits in the book is um, I, had, uh, I hired an illustrator and uh, he created a, an image where the um, stoics are like the Beatles. Yeah. Crossing Abbey Road. And uh I'd never seen, uh, and of course I'm a George girl, so I have Epictetus as George uh, <laughs> and Marcus as John, and uh, but I um, I love uh, I, I, there's 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 such a generosity of spirit when you're to, talking with people who are also interested in um, sharing stoic beliefs because there's always something new or a new interpretation. And 
it's amazing, Steve. Like, Good Morning America, People Magazine, Oprah, all these corners of pop culture are wanting to interview me and talk about why, why stoicism uh, is important now. And, I, and, and that woman from People is like, can you believe it? <laughs> stoicism will be in People Magazine, which is America's billboard. Wow. And I think a rising tide lifts all boats. So what's good for one is good for all. And this is great for all of us. Absolutely. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It has it, been it's where hard work meets a <laughs> meets fortune here, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. The uh, preparation and opportunity. Is that it? Is that what Mark Rosario well, said about that? We're very we're somewhere in the ballpark. Ballpark philosophy. Yeah, there we are. Right, That's what, what I, I love about it. Podcast, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> But one th one thing I, I I really enjoyed the chapter. You talk about the importance of a life philosophy, which I agree with, and then you immediately go into one of my nemeses, uh, the pig dog, the Schweinhund, uh, and and how to overcome your inner pig dog. And I, I'll let you explain what what you mean by the inner pig dog. But I, I definitely have one, and 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 he sometimes wins, and sometimes I conquer him. But uh, it's it's a it's a battle. I. <laughs> I love, sorry, that's my dog. We that's, weren't oh, talking so about you. <laughs> he, he, he must have heard we were talking about him. Yeah. Um, my, you just engaged my Schweinhound. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but I, I love the idea of the Schweinhound, um, which is our pig dog, which uh, is a German word. I mm -hmm. love German compound words. Oh yeah. I yeah. love that. Um, when you chub up from, uh, as many people have over the uh, COVID, that um, the German word is, it's um, Kummerspeck, meaning grief bacon. Um, <laughs> and I love, like, there's a word that means face in need of a fist. So if I you know, just I know think that pharma bro, that guy, <laughs> that's, that's what that looks like. That's a visual. Um, and uh, so the pig dog is the lazy uh, part of ourselves that barks and grunts and uh, keeps us from our better selves. There's an amazing folklore tale where uh, a grandfather's talking to his grandson and he says, you know, there are two dogs inside me. And he said, you know, one is a good dog, like my dog, Fredo. And one is a bad dog that's aggressive and snarling. And the grandson says, well, you know, with these two dogs fighting inside you, who wins? And he says, the one I feed the most. <laughs> so I try to keep my Schweinhound on a uh, restricted diet. I, um, uh, but then again, everything in moderation, including moderation. So having days off is, a, uh, I think you know, we do need to be a friend to ourselves. Sure. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I had a lot of fun writing um, this letter about your inner Schweinhound and, uh, and then just filling the book with sidebars and little crazy bits of ephemera that <laughs> tend Plot, to work. Flotsam and jetsam. <laughs> yes, the way that when you were having a conversation and you ping pong all around. Right. And I wanted these letters to feel very conversant and uh, and feel radiant and feel like it is not passive. I wanted... Absolutely reading this to feel uh, uh more active yeah and, and 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 it is it certainly is you you never know what's going to be on the next page you might have a brief pause and a some interesting facts or a, a story or a fable and then off to the races again and and, and it works very well i think um Thank another you another much. theme that pops up again and again are jackasses in your in your yes case. uh uh, so these are, the, I understand you have two of your own. 
Uh, we we yes. adopted one briefly on our farm when I was younger that we, we were a farm that often, as you worded it, ended up with used animals. Um, mm -hmm. My dad found a sick duck next to the road and brought it to the farm and nursed it back to health. We had a, a, a jackass that my uncle named Elmer after the glue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, <laughs> but then, but they found him a home with another jackass. And so he, he wasn't there long, but we, we, we had a few in our day as well. They are wonderful creatures. Would you like to talk about why jackasses uh, are, are near to your heart? Um, I, uh, my, my husband's family has had a farm in the Berkshires of Connecticut and we, it, our farm has become a repository for the future farmers of America's animals that they raise. So we've had water buffaloes, we've had two water buffaloes, we raise belted Galloways, but for bloodlines. And um, during the pandemic, several farmers went out of business, mm -hmm. were not in good health. So we took over their herds. Um, so I always use the term used animal because they weren't rescued. I mean, I didn't climb a ladder into a burning orphanage. They essentially <laughs> just you know, made a few clicks. Um, but I love jackasses. I love how comical they look. I love how they are always in partners. The reason why Elmer probably couldn't live alone is because jackasses need a partner. Uh, when I was in a little bit better health, I was a uh, hospital chaplain. Yeah. And there was a hospice in New York, upstate New York, where they had two jackasses that were therapy animals and went to the hospice and they would walk in to the medical unit. And this was a rural area. And you know the donkeys would then put their heads down on the residents and they're just so calm. Racehorses also often have a jackass in their stable. So I've just, uh, I really love, uh, I love the quadrupeds, Equus asinus. Do you know <laughs> that they're um, genetically somehow related to the elephant? Hmm. Because of their, the way their lips uh, are almost prehensile. Right. Like our donkeys, we live in a cold climate and we have horse blankets, but our donkeys will use their lips and unbuckle the blankets on one and then the brother will then undo them and then they both are running around uh, without <laughs> a warm enough blanket so they have to stay in the barnyard but uh there's something we can learn so much for animals and I was a late in life uh animal enthusiast and I think there's nothing worse than a reformed uh animal I was reluctant and now I'm like Anatole France like part of your until you've loved that animal part of your soul hasn't been awakened you're and one of those on people farm, <laughs> no I know I've, I've turned one of those I have turned into one of those jackasses Steve. but but yet you you talk about friends uh and you you have weasels and jackasses uh, uh as 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 a moniker as a way to describe uh, friends and relationships with friends in one of your chapters yes. uh, uh, talking to your son about choosing friends and 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 when it's okay to walk away from a difficult you know from a friend that's not worth it and and that's a hard decision to make because you feel I should stick I should stick this out and 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 I should I should be there but sometimes it's not the right thing to do. And it's, it's good advice to give to somebody. Would, would you, how do you, how do you take a weasel and a jackass and apply it to uh, friendships? Well, thank you. That refined taxonomy. Yes. Um, well, because I love jackasses, jackasses are the good guys. <laughs> Weasels. Um, you know, it's important to be a friend to yourself. And um, I believe that loyalty was a virtue. And uh, to the point where I was, I always felt like you can never turn your back on a friend. And 
Uh, and then I realized that uh, some, some people are just weasels and I have to weed my social garden. And I think that's a good lesson to learn for all of us, especially women who are socialized to be peacemakers. But sometimes when someone's been a real weasel and uh, has the all the bad habits and slovenliness and bad habits are contagious. But I think it's important to respect yourself and to have standards. Sorry about that, my Schweinhund. Um, but it's important to have have standards and mm -hmm. care about yourself. That's important. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so choose the <laughs> jackass and uh, be a jackass and not a weasel is another good. And <laughs> A, a I, good, kind of, good I also the collective noun of weasel is a confusion. <laughs> Isn't that interesting. That is. My um, I, I I I had an encounter with a weasel, and what I didn't realize is that weasels, when kind of when, when cornered, will do this dance trying to hypnotize you, <laughs> and. I try uh, that too. It was, it was spectacular. <laughs> Actually, uh, what have I done? It worked. <laughs> I've lost 10 pounds and I quit smoking. Yes. Um, but the, uh, uh, and also weasels um, have a uh, defense system very similar to a skunk. Uh -huh. So they can I think detonate ferrets stink do bombs out of their rear quarters. So there was, there were, there was a lot of thought into why uh i had jackasses and uh and weasels <laughs> and i also love how um was it chrysophus the um philosopher who oh, died of laughter right right yeah you i believe you're right eating figs yeah, yeah that Don sounds like Don a real knee slapper <laughs> donald robertson compared that to uh like the the world's deadliest joke the monty python sketch where oh. you know, they, they have a joke that can just decimate the enemy with laughter it's the the donkey <laughs> the donkey joke from chrysippus yeah or the jackass joke yeah so yeah, i i have yet to have anyone even break a smile other than laughing at the i don't know i guess it works because we're thousands of years Here later we are again still talking about absolutely it. now mm -hmm. now you had a run-in with a weasel uh, mm -hmm. You also had a run-in with a bear. <laughs> and have you? I ha have you had I, a bear encounter? Uh, I have. Luckily, I was with. Well, I had a couple. Once I was with two or three people. Luckily, because Mama Bear and Cub walked out in front of us on the trail, and she had charged someone the day before, but they were alone. There were three of us, so Mama Bear looked at us and then took off into the bushes. So. You were not so fortunate on your encounter, uh, but it's on a chapter about courage, I believe, uh, in Invictus, uh, I believe is the title of that chapter, if I'm not mixing it up in my mind. Uh, tell yes. us about that. And the response of the, uh, who could have been your your knight in shining armor hauling you away and and their their response to your plea for help was a little sad. <laughs> it was it was crazy. Yes, I was out for a walk. Um, uh on a sunny afternoon and a uh I, I live in a very rural area and a driver said oh you know i saw a cub about a mile away but just keep your heads up i said okay and then i was returning and i was like oh i'll keep my eye out for that cub and then i realized oh well if it's a cub the mom's quite close <laughs> and uh so a bear did come charging out of the forest Ooh. and 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 did charge me and um rammed me wow. and uh it was unbelievable because to feel like prey and to get close enough where you can like the, the fur is on you <laughs> and um wow. so i wasn't clawed and it's the north american black bear which are omnivores um but the mother and, and the growl was truly a bowel evacuatingly scary growl 
from this yearling bear. And then the mom just came flying down the mountain and uh, uh, checked on the cub and then went to go check on me. And I was stuck between a cub and a mom. Ugh. And I figured, well, just stay aware. I, I was a park ranger when I was in college. So uh, I knew how to make myself put my hands up, not make, don't run, don't climb a tree for um, black bears. And uh, eventually a car, I was able to flag down a car. And I was like, excuse me, I'm between a bear cub and a mama bear. Can you just take me down the road? And the woman's like, I don't know you. And I was like, but, but bear, like, I live on this, but there's a bear. Can I lay and on your hood? I'll just lay on the hood. Just haul me off. <laughs> she was like, you can walk behind me. And I was like, oh my, I, I, I wish I was so shocked because you know, we live in a community where we look out for each other. And right. this was during the pandemic. And, uh, it was, uh, I, I, and I and I and I burst into tears, and I was like, "You're really not going to help me." And she was like, "No." <laughs> and um, I did see her when I found somebody else. Uh, about an about forty minutes later, another car came, and I was got to get. I actually it was a two seater. I had to get into the trunk, um, and I got back, and she was she was there. And I I didn't speak to her, but I thought like, I just hope that if she that no one will ever do uh her actions and listen she was based in fear sure. like i don't know how scary a middle-aged woman in yoga pants is but <laughs> I'm i <intimidated>. thought <laughs> but uh yeah it was just uh it just gave me an opportunity as a thought experiment to think like what was her story going home that night oh what happened to you Oh, nothing. <laughs> or, oh, yeah, I saw this woman and she said she was being chased by a bear, but I didn't see a bear. But I showed her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, I, I just think that's what's so great about being a writer is uh, your imagination clicks in. You do do a lot of thought experiments. Um, and uh, I, I just, I love the challenge of looking at a blank page mm -hmm. and thinking, all right, what's, what's in store for me today? I love it. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Actually, uh, just a side note, all of most of my bear experiences were I was a volunteer for a summer in the North Cascades National Park, uh, uh, working in that national park. And that's when I ran into lots of, of black bears myself was, was, I wasn't a ranger, but I was, I was a volunteer in the park system for a summer and, and, uh, had How, lots of bear well, training. <laughs> well, thank you for your service for, <laughs> I mean, our park service, this is why Theodore Roosevelt, um, is so important. I think with his conservation efforts, um, and, uh, creating the national park service, it's such a gift and, uh, it's a gift to all of us. Absolutely. Everyone. Can it's use a it. big That's carrot. Uh, you talk about uh, <laughs> low level <laughs> happiness and small carrots are, are, are two themes as well. And the national parks are, are to me, a, a big carrot. It's a big, or a, or a big, a big deal. You know, it's a big source of happiness. Oh. It was so funny. My dad and I, my dad had never been to Yellowstone and we, he picked me up in Canada when I graduated to take me back to Ohio. That was before I moved here. And we came down to Yellowstone and he was being a jackass. Uh, sorry, <laughs> not in the way that you uh, discussed earlier, but he's like, oh, so where are the bear? We're in the park. Where are the bear? We were like 20 <laughs> feet into the into the park and we go around a corner and a black bear is chasing a herd of elk across the street right in front of us. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. like, like, like on cue, like, there's the bear dad, you know, unbelievable. <laughs> it's like Hollywood. Uh, Absolutely. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So are there, um, are those grizzlies in that part um, of the in Yellowstone, in the North Cascades, they were, mo they were black bear in, in Yellowstone, they have a mix of both. 
Um, mm-hmm. That was a black bear that we saw. We saw a grizzly later further away, but yeah, I, I've only run into gr- or into black bears at close range. I have luckily not encountered a grizzly close up because that, that's a little more intimidating. I mean, they're both intimidating as hell, but but uh, grizzlies also have a bit of uh, are known for a bit of an attitude on top of their menacing size. So yes, uh, yes, uh, the hundred hundreds of pounds. The other, I was uh, out for a walk with my with my business partner, uh, and. We have a a female bear that uh, is lame, so only has three operating limbs, and she had quads. She had four cubs. Wow! And so I researched this, and that black bears, when a cow only has one bear, they often reject it, hmm. and uh, because to keep that cub alive takes so many resources that um, it is uh, unusual to only have one cub. Um, And uh, most of the time there are multiple births in the, um, with with a bear, which is interesting. Like this is like, like, I kind of love going off on these weird trajectories, (laughs) like, like finding out like, like that the male sea catfish does something called mouth brooding. Oh, and yeah. so, so the female lays the fish eggs into the male's mouth and the male then gives birth, hatches these eggs through his pie hole. I mean, this, this is nature is fascinating. It sure is. I mean, and then and there, there's so many things I just like, like uh, I have to just weave this story in. I, I I try to 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 work those things into my biology class when possible, just because I get this <laughs> the the dead eyes of the sleepy freshman, and then mm-hmm. it's like, but this thing, look at this thing, it's all cool. <laughs> it's so good. Yep, yep, so absolutely. Good. There's so much to learn out there, and and that comes through in your book that you are interested and you defeat the pig dog and you're at your reading. And I'd love to see your note taking process because I bet uh, there's margins written in and all kinds of things. Cause you you're able to pull this information from your reading and then apply it to a new situation, which re- requires beating that forgetting cycle that, that is so easy to, to, to fall into where you learn it and then it's gone unless you use it immediately. And, and uh, you must have some good some good study habits, uh, which is something that's important to impart on the young. You know, woman. I love. Um, there's a fellow who makes it's called book journals, and he just takes old textbooks and turns them into notebooks, uh-huh. and then they're just. I just write in quotes. You know, it's funny. I learned this this very uh, sophisticated note taking system where I just write things down. Um, I was working with. Rodney Dangerfield on a Rodney Dangerfield movie and he had a spiral notebook and uh it looked like he'd been carrying the same spiral notebook for 50 years (laughs) and uh I asked him about it and he was like yeah kid come up with an idea you write it down it's always right here (laughs) and um I didn't ask him what would happen if when he if he lost it but um (laughs) I've I've lost absolute um outlines and proposals of books and it's all up here in your noodle it's not that devastating um i think it's more devastating uh when it's on a computer because uh we it's interesting i went to a hand i I have neuropathy in my hands and uh so i have two fingers that work on each hand uh which is all i need to carry a pen and um this handwriting expert uh said that you remember and retain so much more when you handwrite the notes because you engage muscles, more senses. You can remember where it was on the page, left, right, top, bottom, and that your acuity to go through your Rolodex and be like, where was that? You have a visual Mm -hmm. where if you're just with your thumbs, putting it in a notes app, you'll probably never look at it again. Um, but writing it down, using the, the ink that you like, uh, 
and making it nice for yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Why not? Break that opportunity. Well, Duff, do you have a couple more minutes or do you have to fly? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, just to uh, to uh, discuss a, a few more of the themes in, in your in your book, um, there are so many. Uh, it was it was hard for me to figure out what do I. Uh, there, it's so broad, and and there's so many topics, and then all the cool little little side notes like Jeremy Bentham's head uh and I don't you you can read it folks to to, to find yeah. out more but there's I had to look it up and find a video of that too I was, it was isn't it weird. incredible it is it is but I know just, I know it's funny because um over dinner at, at my house you know where I will talk about what I'm working on and my husband can be this doubting Tom and I was like, haven't you learned by now that I will not come to this table without proof? Um, yeah, some of my favorite bits are, um, oh, I love St. Corbinian, the patron saint of bears. Oh, yes. St. Corbinian was um, a hermit in uh, 1200s uh, and wanted to get to Rome. Mm-hmm. And he... I guess a hermit travels pretty light, but he had everything on his donkey and got on his way to Rome. A bear ate his donkey. And so St. Corbinian then had the bear spiritually, magically um, turn into his valet. And when you look up St. Corbinian, his image is there's a bear carrying luggage. And I love, I love, I, I love that. And I well, love um, ne- next to my f- our family farm about, well, five, 10 miles away is a is a Catholic relic shrine mm-hmm. with all kinds of stuff. And they have like you can buy medals for all the saints in there. And I'll have to look for that one next time I'm home, see if I can find a, a, a pendant with a bear carrying luggage. That would be pretty amazing. I know. <laughs> I, I also love St. Isidore. Is the patron saint of the internet? Hmm. Saint Clair is the patron saint of the tel- of television. <laughs> and, uh, now, were I either of them I, alive when these technologies were invented, or does this? No. Yeah, I didn't no, think so. Uh, I mean, there's very... <laughs> Saint Clair of Assisi had visions, um, in a square box. Ah, I see. I see. I see. And uh, so she got that. I like that St. Drago is the patron saint of um, unattractive people. And I pray uh, every day to, uh, to that. <laughs> no, there's another one, St. <laughs> Homo Bonus. St. Homo Bonus was just a good man. Um, and uh, I find, uh, I, 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 it's like finding a jewel when I can you know, present something <laughs> over dinner that will get my toughest critics my husband and son to laugh or no no is, is this an example of what you call small carrots something yes. some little bit of something good in your day to keep you going i mean could you talk about this idea and tie it into what we've been talking about small carrots um are small goals uh give yourself a small carrot just to keep going, Martin Luther King said, you don't have to take the, the whole staircase, just take the first step in faith. And uh, so the idea of where a donkey has a carrot in front of him and you uh, move towards closer and closer to, towards your goals. But I also believe in something that in our family we call the rule of the ostensible destination that Often, uh, I've got to go give a speech tonight, and that's going to be amazing. I'm going to be at the public theater, and uh, it's going to be a challenge, and uh, I will be with a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Mm. but that's going to be amazing. I have seven to ten minutes to speak about a subject behind closed doors. So I'm gonna use the ancient Greeks view of love that there are there are more than one type of love where we tend to just 
think of love as romantic love, eros, or passion. Uh, and the ancient Greeks would find that to be a perversion of love, that there <laughs> are many types. There's brotherly love. There's love of the self. There's love for all mankind. There's ludos, playful love. So I've got to speak about this tonight. And I well, asked- Luckily, you've written about it. So you-, you Well, uh, you have, yes. <laughs> I, 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 that, that helped. But um, how to keep it interesting for- seven to 10 minutes and how to keep it condensed. So I asked a buddy of mine and what would he do? And it's Bill Murray and Bill Murray does things with unusual, great flair. He said, I've got a great idea. Just get an atomic fireball jawbreaker and put it in your mouth. <laughs> and then start talking. And then when it stops being spicy, I bet you, um, that it'll give you just about eight minutes. So I've been practicing with hot tamales, red hot, Mike and Ike's atomic fireball. So I've been practicing um, my elocution with uh, jawbreakers. Well, that's wonderful. Mouth. You can thank St. Saint, Saint Bill. I, I sent my, in, my sister-in-law that portrait of him done up like a saint. Uh, she's a, my brother once said if, if, if uh, she would ever leave him uh, for another man, it would be for Bill. So I, I sent her that when she was going through some heavy stuff and it cheered her up quite a bit. So, Oh, he, that's he, so great. Even from was, afar, his um, magic still works. So, <laughs> you know, he has, he has that gift and, uh, he, he is a true, uh, stoic and he studied at the Sorbonne, uh, right after the success of Ghostbusters just didn't want to be a Hollywood jackass. Sure. So he spent four years studying philosophy at the Sorbonne and then came back and did all those fantastic movies. Um, but I love that he's always aware of how to squeeze as much fun out of life, <laughs> but also how he gives so much. Sure. He just give so much of himself. It's and I really think beautiful. that goes back to your idea of low level happiness and, and small care. It's just always doing something meaningful and, and rewarding each day. So you don't look back and say, what happened? What did I do? I'm, I'm, it's about time for me to, to slough off this mortal coil. And I've been kind of a wasted time. <laughs> we don't exactly. want to do that. When you think about it, life is only, if we're lucky, 4,000 weeks. When you look at it like an actuarian, uh, memento mori. Uh, it's funny because people are like, don't you find being a, a hospice chaplain or dealing, helping you know, with living with chronic pain, chronic illness, depressing? And I was like, no, I feel like if anything, it's really jimmied up my appreciation like, for even the moments when I'm having more of a tough day of it. So uh, I think to be awake, and that's where I feel um, is the great gift of our, of our Stoics. And I am so grateful that you have me on again. I am, it, it is an honor to be a uh, repeat customer of the Sunday <laughs> Stoic. And oh. I love, love listening to your podcast and, uh, I listen to it in the car. I don't drive, but my my when we drive back to the city, you are you and uh, Steve Rennell are on oh. on our playlist. Wow! So. I now now the pressure's on. Uh. <laughs> so well, I I greatly appreciate that. I'm 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 I feel uh, uh, lucky. Uh, uh, Fortuna has smiled upon me to to get to have you on the show again, and I appreciate all you do uh your your book is inspirational the, your work as a chaplain the the advice you give your son in 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 this in this work in this book and and your even your reading habits and your attitude about how to to wring the most out of life uh is excellent advice and i i highly recommend everyone check out this book and i'll have a link when the show releases in the show description uh where where everyone can find it and it comes out April the 12th, right? Let me make sure. April the 12th. Yes. I'll, I'll be on Good Morning America on the 12th. Um, 
and uh, you were my very first interview, so thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, don't be a stranger there, Steve. Really great to see you. It's great to see you too, Duff. Uh, have a have a great speech tonight. I don't break a leg. How whatever the great uh, the. I don't know. Uh, break a jaw. Break a jaw. jaw breakers. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So thanks again for being on the show. Congratulations with this new book. It's it's an excellent read. And to all my listeners out there, uh, seize the day. Carpe diem. Carpe noctum. Indeed. Seize the night. <laughs>